really likes disruption, and we've had a lot of disruption in the uh, industry of journalism and news, certainly in the past 15 years, because time was before the internet, there was uh, gatekeepers ruled the day. And so news companies, newspapers, and television stations uh, were able to control the flow of information. And especially with newspapers, created these uh, distribution monopolies. Uh, and that was their business model. So for advertisers who wanted to reach these audiences, they had to pay the newspaper company um, to, to reach them, because they were the only ones who, could, who controlled that information. And then the internet came along, of course, and knocked down the fences. And some media companies were left still guarding a gate without a fence, and that looked kind of foolish. And some of them are still doing it today. Um, but this new uh, era without fences has created an era of entrepreneurial journalism that is much different than it was before. So the barriers to entry to start a news company are much lower than they used to be. Um, prior to the internet, uh, a news startup was a fairly rare thing. Um, CNN and USA Today were some pretty famous startups in the 1980s. Um, but because you'd have to buy a printing press or you know, start a broadcast station, uh, there was not a lot of entrepreneurial activity when it came to news and journalism. Of course, that's changed uh, thanks to the digital age. And so now we have companies like Demand Media and the Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, and you know a very long list uh, of fairly sizable companies um, that have you know burst onto the scene and found business success. Um, most of you, I'm sure, know that the Huffington Post was recently acquired by AOL for $315 million. Um, and demand media, you know, is given a lot of um, grief in journalism circles, but as a content business, it's pretty impressive that they are able to uh, grow that to the point of taking it public a few months ago. So in the era of free content, I think a lot of people are, are surprised that that is succeeding, but it certainly is. So how many of you know who Phil Meyer is? Phil Meyer was, uh, is, he's not was, he's a, he's a still is. Uh, he was my advisor when I was in graduate school at North Carolina. Um, but he's famous because of a couple of books that he wrote. Um, one of them was called The Vanishing Newspaper, published in 2004. And in The Vanishing Newspaper, Phil predicted that the last newspaper would be published in the first quarter of 2043. And if you didn't know anything about Phil Meyer, well, he's like the original journo geek. So he wrote a book about computer-assisted reporting in 1972 called Precision Journalism. So he came up with this estimate only after lots and lots of data analysis. Um, but Phil's important today because he also wrote about the influence model in this book called The Vanishing Newspaper. And the influence model is uh, very important today when it comes to entrepreneurial journalism. So this means that uh, what Phil found is that there's a correlation between business success for a publisher and the quality of content that they're publishing. So it means that advertisers wanted to be tied to a publisher that not only could attract audience and numbers of people, but also had an influence within that community. They wanted to be seen with them. We see that play out all over the internet now with digital news startups. Um, so the communities that have formed around TechCrunch, Paid Content, Talking Points Memo, and Tree Hugger, you know, these are very influential communities and advertisers know that they need to be there. So these have become very successful businesses and each of them were started as one person blocks. So TechCrunch, also acquired by AOL recently for a reported 25 to $30 million. Uh, paid Content was acquired by The Guardian a couple of years ago. And Tree Hugger started by Graham Hill out of his bedroom in Barcelona, because he had to move to Barcelona to follow a pretty woman, so the story goes. And uh, he wanted to create a site that would cover environmental news for people who were in the mainstream and not you know, completely radical zealots about environmentalism. And so with this growing industry around green business, there were lots of advertisers who wanted to be part of that community. And so a couple of years ago, Discovery Networks bought Tree Hugger for $10 million. And they continue to operate it today, and actually Graham Hill still works there. So the influence model loves niches or location. Um, this is a, um, a really important area for um, new startups, because they can find niches 
that weren't available before the digital age. It's a great quote from Lisa Williams, who's the founder of Place Bar Blogger. She says, the web favors things that are narrowly comprehensive. That is, everything about something. Newspapers, by contrast, are variety shows, something about everything. And so we see the power of niche play out successfully for different businesses that are new startups. So where I live in Seattle, there is something called the West Seattle Blog, which um, in journalism circles has become sort of famous for being a very successful, um, hyper-local uh, startup. So husband and wife team run it. Um, I often say that the people who live in West Seattle are among the most well-informed citizens about their local community, possibly in the history of the United States. The West Seattle blog is that good at local coverage. And the advertising, the business community, know, figured this out pretty fast. And so without even trying, um, the West Seattle blog now has more than $100,000 a year in annual advertising revenue. And they do no cold calling. They only pick up the phone and answer it. Uh, one business, one bar and grill opened up in West Seattle a couple of years ago. They put an ad on the West Seattle blog, and on opening night, they had a line around the block. Because the influence of the West Seattle blog makes them so important in their community. And that's uh, been playing out well for them. Sacramento Press takes it a little differently. So what's interesting about the Sacramento Press, it's another local independent startup, but their number one revenue source is actually social media consulting. So a bunch of young guys and gals who got really good at social media to try to promote their own business and grow this brand called Sacramento Press. Um, the advertisers that they were asking to buy advertising on the site noticed, and they started saying, well, can you teach us this Facebook and this Twitter? And they said, well, yeah, if you'll pay us. And so they've created a pretty nice little revenue stream out of some social media marketing consultancy. <coughs> And then TechDirt, I think, is one of the best um, and most innovative business models, and I love this. So they have a, a place on their site on the primary navigation, CWF plus RTV, which stands for connect with fans and give them a reason to buy. And so if you go to this page on the site, you'll see things that you can buy, like for $25, the paywall shirt. Um, you can buy a day with TechDirt for $1,000. You can buy... Um, uh, business plan review by the folks at TechDirt for $5,000. And it's all kinds of very, you know, sort of off-the-wall products that probably don't get sold every day or all that often. But it is uh, kind of a way for them to test out what people will do to support the site. Because in, in essence, that's what they're doing. They're doing less about buying a product. The other innovative business model is the insight community, which you also see on the navigation, where the folks who read TechDirt are super, super smart tech people. And companies like Dell and Cisco um, and IBM want to know what they think about new ideas and new products. And so what they do is they pay TechDirt to form sort of these ad hoc focus groups. And you can go in and you can earn TechDirt money. It's kind of a virtual currency by participating in this insight community. And so they've, done, they've taken the influence model and really um, innovated and made it even more um, aggressive than anything we've seen before. And so the influence model also works um, with, um, without advertising. So when it comes to uh, nonprofits and entrepreneurial journalism, this is actually probably the fastest growing space. Um, the nonprofit revenue model of donations and uh, foundation support uh, is really taking off. And um, we see a lot of money flowing to startups, sometimes, like in the case of the Bay Citizen in, in San Francisco or ProPublica, um, it's largely done from one really wealthy individual. In the case of the Texas Tribune, which is here in Austin, uh, it's, a case, it's a situation where they have more than 100 corporate donors, and, more than, and they have 2,000 or 3,000 individual um, donors. They do events that sponsors um, pay twenty dollars to $25,000 to sponsor. They have all these kinds of different ways to bring in money. And, and so it's, it's kind of evolving to be more like an NPR model, where people want to support the site and the work that they're doing. But the interesting thing about nonprofits and entrepreneurial journalism in the past couple of years is we've noticed there are so many more people giving to journalism than have ever given before. If you're around the journalism community in the past 20 years, if you think about nonprofit support, you think Knight, McCormick, and Ford, and that's about it. But a lot of these new startups, from the St. Louis Beacon to MinPost, are getting amazing donations and amazing support locally for people who really want to support journalism in their community, but have never given to journalism before. And so that's why this has become a really fast-growing